Yeah, this uh, term bite and devour one another is a pretty strong expression. Um, Vincent Word Study says it's a strong expression of partisan hatred exerting itself for mutual injury. Hmm. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris says stum. I can never pronounce his name, but it says these words are used by him emphatically for he did not merely say bite, which denotes an angry person, but likewise devour, which denotes one who persists in wickedness. He who bites has exhausted his angry passion, but he who devours has given demonstration of extreme cruelty. This seems to suggest that they were not all really in one accord in Galatia, that um, there was much dispute among themselves, probably about their new doctrine as well as you know other stuff. But uh, this can be expected with legalism because, you know, especially this type of legalism, because new questions would probably come up, and uh, after all, uh, they are they are kind of bound to the circumcision by salva- uh, necessary for salvation thing. But how long would it be before another similar laws and regulations were added to this list? There were probably people there that were like, yeah, okay, we we agree, Jesus plus circumcision, but that's all we're going to, you know, it's all we we believe. But there were no doubt people there were saying, well, yes, but now circumcision in, what about, you know, this, what about that? There was quite a lot that would would necessarily flow after that. So there was probably... Uh, they were probably being consumed by one another, even in this uh, in this heresy. Mike, hmm. Galatians chapter five, verse sixteen. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul, in the previous two verses, has talked both about how to keep the whole law through loving others as yourself. And then in the next verse talks about watching out that you who do not love your neighbor, you might end up being consumed by one another. Now he was showing us uh, the other, uh, the, the power source, if you will, with which to use to live out this daily other-centered love. Uh, as followers of Jesus, we are not left alone to try to walk out this other-centered love. We have the Holy Spirit there indwelling us, guiding us, uh, and and just generally showing us the way. As I think both Chris and I have mentioned before, when you are born again and you let God live through you, uh, he begins to change you from the inside out. You begin to hate the things which you used to love and love the things which you wanted to love but just didn't. This includes uh, especially the flesh, uh, which is why Paul writes here, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Definitely. Um, walking in the Spirit is a pretty interesting phrase. It's used all throughout the Bible, this idea of, of something that we're doing. We're walking in the Spirit, and it's a choice that we can make on a daily basis. We have, as saved people, two natures, the flesh and the Spirit. And this, uh, this is a new power that we have that unsaved people do not, and that is the power over sin. Romans chapter 6 is a great read for, for more information on this, uh, your new power over sin. Starting at verse 14, For sin will not have dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Uh, do you not know that if you present, present yourselves to one another as obedient slaves, ye are slaves of the one whom you, you obey, either to sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that ye, you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now... So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have uh, been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Very good.
Very good. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the de desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So Paul here is contrasting the desires of the flesh with the desires of the spirit. The desires of the flesh are things like impurity, sexual immorality, drunkenness, idolatry. The works of the spirit uh, are things like joy, peace, and love. We as natural men do not want the works of the spirit uh, in and of ourselves. Uh, they are just they are against themselves and diametrically opposed to each other. Uh, not because they are so opposed to to each other uh, now because it, because they are so opposed to each other. Excuse me. Now because they are so opposed to each other, uh, it's interesting uh, to see that when you walk by the Spirit, uh, sometimes in a practical sense, when you begin to walk by the Spirit. Sometimes impurity, idolatry, and the rest actually begin to increase for a little bit. Uh, in that sense, it's sort of like ripping the scab off a wound. Uh, the key to this uh, is to continue to walk in the Spirit, uh, continue to pray for others, continue to read the Word, continue to love others as, as yourselves, continue to in fasting and continue to memorize God's Word. Uh, these are all practical actions that one can take to keep the connection line between ourselves and God open. Uh, and this is what one can do to walk in the Spirit and to keep from doing the things the old nature wants to do. Chris? Yeah, that, that's something I was trying to hit a little later too. How do you walk in the Spirit? Um, the verse says, For the flesh lusts is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. One quote here, this is uh, from Guzik. Walking in the Spirit is the key, but it doesn't always come easily. Often it is a battle. There is a battle going on inside the Christian, and the battle is between the flesh and the Spirit. As Paul writes, these are contrary to one another. They don't get along at all. When the flesh is winning the inside battle, you do, you do not do the things that you wish. You don't live the way that you want to. You live under the flesh instead of under the Spirit. The fact is... The fact of this battle, the fact, it says, the fact of this battle should wake us up. If you don't know you are in battle, you will always lose. Also, the fact of the battle teaches us that effort is required to walk in the spirit. God doesn't just knock us over and, uh, you know, uh, and we have, to, we have to seek it and block out the things which hinder the walking in the spirit. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And therefore ye have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk ye in him. So it's pretty interesting that uh, you know, we are to do something, that the walking in is something that we do. So how do we walk in him? How do we walk in the Spirit? One thing I would suggest is to ask for more of him and ask for more of the Spirit. Ask that he will fill you with the Spirit, that you might be better able to, to understand what his will is for you in any given situation. And this will certainly increase your conviction to go the way uh, that his spirit is leading as opposed to the flesh. More of him also equals more ability uh, for us to be obedient to him. It's kind of this symbiotic kind of relationship. Um, one great verse that explains this is when uh, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Excuse me. He says, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are, uh, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But this my father is, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Mike? I love it when uh, you can look at Scripture through other Scripture. It's like the coolest, it's the coolest thing. 